Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio with your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Today, we're continuing part two of our interview with Guy White. Guy, welcome to the show. Thank you. I want to ask you about uh, celebrating holidays with the family. You know, you're, you're married to Suzette Hubbard, and, and you're, you're beginning to have children. And, and how would you celebrate the holidays with, with Mary Sue? Would you get together at her house, or what, did you, what happened? We always went to Mary Sue's house on Christmas Day. Um, so we might have Christmas at our house. Kids wake up in the morning, and um, we would have Christmas in the morning at our house or at Christmas Eve. But Christmas Day was at Mary Sue's. It was definitely fond memories, and um, Mary Sue liked to put on a good Christmas, and um, so yeah, they were always good. Dinner was good, food was good, presents were good, family there was good. It was a um, really good time with her. So Christmas, we would be there. At other times, there would be like a birthday, celebrating some a birthday for someone in the family, um, having just an invitation over for dinner. Um, so yeah, multiple reasons to visit Mary Sue. Hey, just a, a couple of questions. If Mary Sue wanted to go out shopping for clothes, could she get in a car and just drive to the mall or did she always have to have someone with her? You know, she always had someone driving her. There was, it's a kind of interesting story. Um, Mary Sue and my mother had never met. So the two grandmas for the kids had ne hadn't met. And my mother was going to be in town. And so it was organized for them to meet. And Mar that's the only time I saw Mary Sue drive herself. And she drove, um, I forget the car, but the car was purchased for her by LRH. And so she came um, down the hill and everyone was already there parked and that's the only time i ever saw her drive herself ah that's interesting well how did mary sue and your your mom get along they were they got along great and uh, mary sue said she liked my mother after and vice versa did they ever talk on the phone did they become like phone friends no or no, no they didn't but there was a, an interesting thing where when suzette was pregnant and we knew it was going to be a boy the first one and Mary Sue says to Suzette, name him Daniel, right? Hmm. Independ independently, my mother says to me, name him Daniel. We had already decided his name was going to be Tyson, right? right? So, but he is Daniel Tyson, Hubbard White, goes by Tyson. M Mary Sue liked you quite a bit. She did. She did. There's... um. In, in fact, I've saved all the letters I got from her and notes and that sort of thing. And there's one in particular where she says, I couldn't have asked for a better son-in-law. And, for, you know, that's very, very nice. The, the, the thing is, though, it's a sad ending with Mary Sue. At one point, I met with the attorney, Graham Berry, and also Von Young. Von Young was there. I met with him twice. Von Young was there once. And... It was just Graham and I another time. And apparently I was seen because there's PIs on Graham. And somehow it got back to, I found this out later, somehow it got back to Mary Sue that I had blown the location of where she lived. Because that was always, nobody knew of that. That was secure. So it was called a secure location and that I had blown that and Mary Sue then was moved from her house to another location towards the beach Redondo Beach or Huntington Beach or something like that and was there for a good amount of time like a year I want to say maybe up to two year and a half um, and so there was no contact with me during that whole time and Mary Sue was of the understanding that it was me who blew the location, which is absolutely not true. Um, so I didn't see Mary Sue again after that. And when she died, um, it was kept, well, a couple things about that. First, there was a memorial for her that was held at uh, author services. And so there was Suzette and the three kids, three at that point. And I wasn't invited because of this 
issue. Suzette and the kids were not going to go because I wasn't invited. And the, the comment to me was, you know, she loved him, right? Um, that I should be there. But, you know, I wasn't there and that was held and it was kept to be kept very quiet. In fact, the kids had lost both grandmothers. And when Mary, you know, like weeks apart, when Mary Sue died, they were instructed to not tell anyone. So these kids are going to school and, you know, noticeably, I'm sure they were a little off from their usual bubbly selves and were not, we were instructed that they couldn't tell anyone that Mary Sue had died. It was kept a secret. There was no announcement in any Scientology publication. There was, it was just like, it didn't happen. She's just disappeared. Um, that is so strange. Now, now, Mary Sue died in 2002 of lung cancer, correct? Um, uh, lung cancer or breast cancer? Yeah. I, you know, I'm not certain. Well, I know well, she had had breast cancer and, yeah. you know. Um, but her final days, did Suzette get to be with her when she was sick? Was she in the hospital? Did she die at the house or in, she, in a she hospital? Died, she died at home. She died at home, her home. And she was back there, obviously, at some point from when she was moved. Um, and But she, I remember talking to Suzette, and Suzette said you know, she didn't want anyone to see her like that. So mm. no one was there. No, what a sad, sad way to die. Now, I, I, I can understand some people wanting, wanting to die alone. Mm -hmm. And it was Mary Sue cremated? She was. She was. She was cremated and... Um, Ashes out to sea. Hmm. Did you feel a great sense of loss when she died? For sure. For sure. Um, and even though there had been that gap of seeing her, um, you know, that in fact, Neville Potter came to my house and delivered a set of um, earthenware, you know, that she mm -hmm. had had on display in her house. And you know, everybody was being given something that had been hers. And so that was given to me. And uh, it was definitely, it was sad. And it was sad that it had to end like that. There was no reconciliation. And sad that that never even needed to happen because I was not the source of blowing the location. Um, and sad that maybe she was upset with me because that's what she was told. Um, Sad that the whole thing was quiet. Here's Scientology and Los Angeles, a huge hub, and her part with LRH in Scientology, and she's just ghosted. Yeah, that, that is, you know, that is extraordinary when you think about she is the, the, the first lady of Scientology, to use that term, and um, she's made a non-person. Did word gradually get out that Mary Sue had passed away? You know, um, if it did, it trickled out. <laughs> you know, I, I and and now, you know, in in publications, there's no reference to her. You know, as well as other family members. You know, I know Suzette had written a policy letter on positioning in in marketing and submitted it and. Her father had approved it, and it was a um, turned it into a policy letter. And initially, it was um, Suzette Hubbard for L. Ron Hubbard, and then later that's gone, and it's just L. Ron Hubbard. Um, and I know that he had dedicated um, one of the books to, I believe it was Science of Survival, to Diana. And in the later prints, there's no dedication to Diana anymore. Um, so yeah, I think the 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 there is an effort to turn Hubbard into a god and take away a human aspect to him, to um, that, you know, he was just this god and there is no family and there is no, um, yeah. It is true that there's always historical revision around L. Ron Hubbard so that he looks like this... Um, bachelor basically mm -hmm. he had he was married three times he had seven children for listeners I, I understand that 
Mary Sue Hubbard ran the Guardian's office and did a lot of horrendous things. Mm -hmm. But what I'm trying to do with you guys is just show show people the human side of her. Yeah, and I, uh, and, you know, it, it is. Go ahead. Sorry. Well, well, what I'm saying is, you know, at the end of her life, she she was repudiated and she had to go to prison for her uh, role in Operation Snow White. She was a broken woman when she got out of prison and she was made a non-person in the Church of Scientology. Yes. And basically lived under house arrest, if you want to call it that, more or less. Mm -hmm. Did she ever talk to you about the time she had to go to jail? Um, no, she didn't talk about that. Yeah, no. and, and you would be too polite to bring it up. Yeah, and, and it's also that it, when I met her, that had already happened. Yeah. Um, and my interaction with her was family. And um, then, but it, as you know, was mentioned, I was in marketing. So when we had new products, there was always one that was sent to Mary Sue, any new thing that came out. And in fact, I have a little story on that. It was, I was sitting with her and at the dinner table and the Phoenix lectures had come out that series. And yeah. she said, um, well, you know why those lectures were done? And I was like, no, we don't know. <laughs> and she said, well, we had no money. <laughs> so he put on the lectures, the, the Phoenix lectures and um, generate some income. So there, there, again, there is a, and not to discredit or credit what is in the Phoenix lectures, the point is, was that was the catalyst to put on those lectures. They had no money and he needed to generate money and that's a real thing. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's a very interesting bit. G going back in time with Ron and Mary Sue, as Ron was creating the materials for Dianetics and Scientology, he was obviously driven by the need to keep his family fed, keep a roof over their heads, right? And it's interesting when you look at Scientology as a business or a corporation, L. Ron Hubbard kept creating new kept creating a bigger product line. There's an interesting story, just as an aside, that to me has always shown a part of L. Ron Hubbard. I don't know if a lot of people can appreciate. But um, when L. Ron Hubbard was living in Phoenix, you know, after the Dianetics Foundation cratered, mm -hmm. in the old days, you know, you used to fill your car radiator with water. Mm -hmm. People didn't use antifreeze, right? No. Yes. And, and so when a freeze was coming, you had to drain your, um, you had to drain the water, the water out. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so that the engine block didn't crack when the water froze. So there's a story online about an old Scientologist, and he's he's around the Phoenix Foundation, and Ron's out back of his place there, the house in Camelback, and uh, he's draining the radiator, and and this guy says, you know, Ron, I'd really like to be friends with you, and Ron says, you know, I I uh, I can't have friends, and to me that that's really shows. Hubbard's frame of mind that he could not have friends. Hmm. Now, he he had Mary Sue. Yeah. And, and we were talking, Guy, when uh, Mary Sue went off to prison mm -hmm. for that short time. Would you say that L. Ron Hubbard became worse in her absence? I mean, I wasn't with him, but well, well, just stories I've been told over, over time that Mary Sue was kind of like... Um, she could keep him grounded. And um, she also had a role where, like, if a staff member needed to go home, you could petition Mary Sue. And she was looking after well-being of staff and the familial side of things. Um, yeah. Yeah, so what, I, I've always taken the view that when uh, Ron lost Mary Sue that, David Miscavige filled that void, mm -hmm. not not as a spouse, certainly, but as an enabler. And that my view has always been that L. Ron Hubbard and David Miscavige brought out the worst in each other. Mm -hmm. Absolutely brought out the worst because Miscavige was willing to be as violent and criminal as he needed to be. Mm -hmm. And and at that point, you know, L. Ron Hubbard wanted all clear. He, mm -hmm. he wanted to be able to go back out in public, right? He did. He, did. He, ne he needed to do a lot of dirty business that Miscavige was all too glad to do. Did Mary Sue ever make any remarks about David Miscavige to you? Or was that off limits? 
No, she did. She um, didn't mince words. She did not like him. And she had said that um, she and and LRH used to call him Little Napoleon. Hmm. Well, that's certainly an apt description. In the Daily Mail piece that they did on you, which was just exquisite, and I really liked the pictures of Mary Sue with her grandkids, uh, you talk about your escape. What were the what were the final events where you and, and Suzette leave Scientology? Well, um, let's see. This would have been 1989. Early in the year, Suzette gets in her car, has Tyson, disappears in the middle of the night. There was no conversation between Suzette and I about that. Um, there isn't a policy letter called Leaving and Leaves where you are not to discuss if you have the urge to leave you can only talk to the chaplain or the ethics officer so otherwise you you know if she were to talk to me my responsibility would be to turn her in mm. um so suzette she, and she told me that the reason because i said why didn't you tell me when we got together later and it was like that she was protecting me in not giving me that information that she was going to leave yeah if you can follow that so she leaves mm. and she takes tyson Right. And immediately there's guards on me because they don't want me to leave. Um, and over time, Sus it's found, you know, they've, Suzette goes to her mother's house, surfaces there, and then there's dialogue with Suzette. At first, they don't know where she is and they're trying to find her. Then she's at her mother's house. And um, there was a point where I was told that Suzette did want to, you know, come back. And then she did not want to come back. And I was then being, when it was finally determined that she wasn't going to come back, the pressure and dialogue with me was that I should divorce Suzette and that the greatest good for the greatest number, as we talk about, of dynamics, that decision, that I would do better being in the Sea Org that would be better for Suzette and Tyson than if I were to leave. And I was buying into that, honestly, at one point. And, but it would never settle. I could never like sit with that. And there was also a key, um, it came, originally came as a letter. It was a letter to John Horwich from LRH when Diana left. And in this letter, he says to John, Roanne goes with you. So his, his daughter has left the Sea Org. John is in the Sea Org. Roanne is to be with John. And Lynn lays out, you know, have her take ballet to develop Poison Grace, you know, get a tutor. And these are, I believe these are the qualifications in the state of California that they're going to need. And goes out through these points and signs off, you know, uh, a, a big program for a little princess, right? Hmm. Um, and that was then turned into programs by the household unit, which was the unit that was originally there for LRH's household. It continued to exist, and the household unit had the resources then for Tyson, for Roanne and to run this princess program. Well, when Tyson is born, it's taken the same thing, and it's the prince program. Roanne and Tyson are the only children on the base at, hmm. at Gold. Yeah. Um, there are no no children there other than those two. So, um, which I'm going to go off on a little tangent here, but while Suzette was pregnant, the issue came out, no kids in the Sea Org. That was oh, yeah, the, the Yeah, the infamous memo from David Miscavige. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it was in in um, put out in Guillaume's name or something. But no kids in the Sea Org while she's pregnant, and then afterwards, and which is why Suzette left, was this issue came out of family time is canceled. Now family time used to be an hour that families would take to get together, that hour with added to their dinner time, right? So um, they would have a bigger chunk of time, and that's when. It was called family time that hour. So, th so that was every day after that dinner. That was every day, yeah. 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 After dinner or before dinner, but you would like marry it with with uh, 
you know, a mill so that you could have more time. And so that, that so we have Tyson and, and we're on the base and then it's like, okay, family time is canceled. And it's not just no kids in the sea or anywhere, not just the base, but then family time is canceled everywhere as well, but also on the base. And Suzette says, no, that's, you know, no, this isn't going to be. And they said, well, we can find no issue covering family time. And Suzette goes, look, I lived it. So find an issue. Um, hmm. So that that crunch that's coming in on Suzette was she wasn't going to live that way. So she left with Tyson, you know. Um, Guy, let me interject here. This uh, this policy, no children in the Sea Org, is exactly what gave rise to the horrendous series of forced abortions in the Sea Org. Forced where, where abortions, by, sure. Yeah, whereby women were convinced it's 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 the greatest good if you abort your child to yeah. so that you can serve the Sea Org. Yeah. Horrendous. Well, and also, you know, the, the on one hand, it's like Hubbard has died, and you know, they're supposed to be we want to codify everything that he said and have all the issues just as he said them. Well, there are many directives from Hubbard on children in the Sea Org and the Cadet Org and the Child Care Org and what's supposed to happen. So this cancellation comes after he's died and, you know, is in conflict with what he said about having a Child Care Org and cadets and, um, you know, and whether that's right or wrong, the the point is, is that it isn't following. If you're going to follow what he says, it isn't following what he said. You know, no, so. no, but but that's Miscavige's policy of picking and choosing. Mm -hmm. You know, he says what Scientology is. And uh, yeah. one time, John Peeler, he was a, an MAA at it base and the chief DPTSer. Mm -hmm. John Peeler came out around the same time as Mark Hadley. And John Peeler once said to me, he said, Jeff, you know, Scientology is whatever David Miscavige says it is on any given day. And, and to me, that was such a revelation because, yeah, you can talk about it has to be Hubbard policy, but really when push comes to shove, it's whatever the hell David Miscavige says it is. Sure. And that's why you can have all this weird stuff going on uh, you know, that's off policy, like no children in the Sea Org. Right. Yeah. So, so Suzette leaves because she wants to have children. Yeah. You're being told to divorce Suzette. Yes. And then, but the thing that I could not, it just wouldn't sit with me was that Tyson, you know, she took Tyson. If she wants to go fine. And if we're going to end it there. Okay. But Tyson should be with me. And I referenced this letter and the mm -hmm. fact that Tyson, well, there was a whole program, the Prince program, based on that same letter, and that there was nothing more exact than those circumstances. The daughter of L. Ron Hubbard left Diana. Rowan goes with John. Now, the daughter of L. Ron Hubbard, Suzette, leaves, and there's only Tyson, single child, single child. He should come with me. And I was told that that couldn't be done. And the reason that couldn't be done was that Mary Sue wasn't happy with the fact that Roanne was not with Diana, right? And that, that Suzette now being with Mary Sue, the concern was that Mary Sue would go legal. So mm. if we tried to enforce that and have Tyson with, with me, um, and so they didn't want a legal battle with Mary Sue. Well, I can't, I can't blame them at all. This would be um, a PR nightmare because would, of these court filings. Mm -hmm. It would be, a, it would be a PR nightmare. And um, so then, though, I'm going. Okay, fear of Mary Sue with the church. Now you're in area where, if someone were to do that, they would, you know, obviously be a suppressive person. And as the dialogue goes on, in as many words, I'm being told that it's, you know the viewpoint on Mary Sue is that she is a suppressive person. So th this culminated with my going up to RTC. And at the time I was, you know, held out at happy Valley. So I was brought in on a motorcycle for these little meetings and 
I'm up at RTC and there's a representative from each of the three branches of RTC, the ethics, the tech, and the admin. And so there's probably about five of us standing around outside and having this conversation. And I say, well then, what is the plan for Mary Sue? And I am told, quote, to let her live out her life, end quote. Now, the significance of that to me is that that's when the whole thing came crumbling down. I realized that at that moment that the group that I thought I was a part of didn't actually exist. And the reason being is, and I'm speaking now of how the, my view was then, as sure. this happened, was one, if you believe in reincarnation, how is letting her live out her life any kind of a solution? What do they think she's going to do? If they really believe she's an SP, she's going to die and come back and be her SP self and attack, right? So, you know, this isn't following Scientology doctrine. Second is that Ron Hubbard has technology that is said to be able to fix a suppressive person. Get a person, a suppressive person is not in their own valence, they're out of valence, and they need to get back in um, their own valence. Um, so why, I'm thinking, why would you not apply, if you've got the technology to handle a suppressive person, why would you not handle Mary Sue, if you really believe it, right? That's a great question. And, and the third one, was that LRH also talks about celebrities, where you have the celebrity themselves, and then those that are connected to the celebrity are all considered in this as a, a celebrity public. Well, this is like L. Ron Hubbard's wife, right? If you're looking at like the importance or significance of that, she should definitely be top priority of someone you would handle. So I'm thinking, you know, that statement to let her live out her life right, goes against the grain on everything that supposedly this organization that I thought I was a part of would have done. They would have handled her, right, would have taken care of her. Um, so there, at that point, I realized that you have my, physically, you have me here, but I am not part of this group anymore because this group isn't the group I thought I was a part of. So then it was real simple. I was needed to go. So I did um, leave. Now, how, how did you leave? You don't just walk off the base. Did you no. escape? or? No, I definitely escaped. The um, um, There were two attempts. And I'll skip the first one. Um, well, two times I escaped. I'll skip the first one because I went back. And um, when I went back, was I was actually, I'm going to talk about it. So there were two escapes. The first escape, I left and went to um, San Diego. And I was at a motel, hotel, and not even checked in under my name. And security had found me, and they're knocking on the door. And uh, the dialogue is look, you know, I just want my son. Yeah. Right. And it was like, I'll do whatever you want me to do. Just get me my son. Okay, we're going to help you do that. We'll address it. We'll get that done. So, okay, great. I go back. And as soon as I go back, driven onto the property, the gates close behind me. And then that I'm going to be taken out. To, I'm thinking, you know, we're going to sit down and work this out. And no, you're going to be, yeah, 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 yeah. But you're going to be out here in Happy Valley, which was that little piece of property that the church owned in the middle of the Saboba Indian Reservation. So you have to have approval from the reservation to drive on their property to get to your property because this is just a little dot in the middle of this thing. And so I'm out to Happy Valley. And, oh. and that's why when I mentioned like any time I would be need to be talked to or whatever, you know, I'd go in on a motorcycle and off of that property and, and talk to RTC, which was, they were the ones that were handling me. So this is, time's going by, months are going by, this isn't happening, I'm still out at Happy Valley, and um, so my first attempt was, I think I can just go over the mountain, and on the other side, uh, it's gonna be 
Palm Springs, the 10 freeway, you know, yeah. I just need to get the other side. Now these are big mountains, right? So I take off from my little cabin that I'm staying in and I'm running up the hill, running, 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 running. And this goes on and on and on. And then I see it starting to get light and it's like, I, I am not going to be anywhere near the top of this and I will be visible on the side of this mountain. So I go running back down the mountain and get into my little cabin. And then I said, you know, when they came to check on me, I don't feel well and just slept well. I've been running up a mountain all night long. <laughs> The, so then I realized that the only way to get out was the way I came in, parallel to run along that road, but not on the road because I would be seen. So I um, planned my when I was going to go, and you know I had been saving um, pieces of you know meat for the dogs. There were dogs out there trying to befriend them, and I would always like have something for them. Anyway, the night I leave, they start barking, right? <laughs> And um, that didn't work. And I'm running along parallel to the road that goes into Happy Valley. And at one point, I can see the Jeeps down there, and they've got, you know, lights looking up. And, you know, so I know for sure I don't, I can't be anywhere near that road, but that is my um, map out, just go parallel to that road. And so at one point, there's a hairpin turn. I, I hit a little road and there's a hairpin turn. And I see I couldn't hear it because the car vehicle was on the other side. But it's now about to turn that hairpin pin turn and I'm on the road. So I literally dove off the side of the mountain, tumbling in rocks and, and sage and um, just kept. It didn't matter. I just needed to go. Kept going, 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 going. Got into the little town there, Hemet. And, you know, it's like middle of the night and everything is closed up. It's a tiny town, except I see a, a, a bowling alley and there's people cleaning the bowling alley. So I go to the door and I'm thinking, you know, I would not let someone in who looked like me. You know, I have a leather jacket that's like ripped. I'm like dirty. I've got blood. And... So I knock on this door and in my broken Spanish say, I've been in a car wreck. I just need to use the phone and make a call. That door gets unlocked. I'm on the other side and it's locked and I was like exhilarated. So that's how I, um, the final escape happened. You know, again, I got to San Diego, made contact with Suzette. She came down, picked me up, and then we started putting our life back together. You know, Guy, that, that is a fascinating story. Um, Hey, just a little, a little uh, Scientology um, parallel because this is so fascinating. You you go to a bowling alley, and that's your way to freedom. Yes. <laughs> <clears throat> go back to to uh, June twenty nineteen seventy seven. <clears throat> Guardian's office agent Michael Meisner, who's being held by the church for mm -hmm. because he knows so much about Snow White. Mm -hmm. He escapes from the apartment. He's being held at in Glendale. <clears throat> calls the FBI, he surrenders to agents who are waiting for him at a bowling alley. Wow. So isn't that interesting? That it is interesting. <laughs> and, then, and Michael Meisner, of course, spills. He becomes a, a witness against the church, tells them everything they want to know about Operation Snow White. Mm -hmm. So his way to freedom was through a bowling alley like yours. Now, mm -hmm. when, when you were reunited with uh, Suzette and Tyson, your son, mm -hmm. The church backs off at that point. They do because they know that now I'm in Mary Sue's camp and they know that there's been these dialogues with me basically um, trying to persuade me to disconnect from Mary Sue and, and Suzette, you know, and bad mouthing Mary Sue and Suzette in an attempt to get me to distance from them. And now I'm over there. So, um, there wasn't an attempt to recover me. Yeah, it was just sort of like uh, they're going to keep an eye on you, but they're not. They're not going to do anything. No. When you leave the Sea Org, you have to make a living. You have yes. a family to support. So, so yeah. what's your first job out of the Sea Org? First job out of the Sea Org was uh, working for a company called um, the Doring Company, and that's Doug Doring, and it was. Um, focused on doing market research 
for dealerships, automotive dealerships of a certain size. If they spend an X amount on advertising, then they were, you know, could afford to get a custom market research study done for their dealership. And this was done all over the US. So I started at that company and could use Doug Doring as a Scientologist. And so I could use the fact that here's my training and here's my experience and that is a valuable uh, the, the, those are recognized as having value otherwise I'm leaving and I am you know in apply putting a resume together I would have this like gap you know yeah that's really interesting because you know a, a Scientology business owner would recognize CR training OEC, FEBC, everything you did. Yes. And a Scientologist would see that as valuable. However, a non-Scientologist would say you worked for the Church of Scientology. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it, that's one problem so many Sea Org members have. And the fact that you were an executive and well-known, you know, helps you out Helps you out a lot. Now, you and Suzette had more children. We did. We had two more. Yeah, your family grew. Mm -hmm. And did you stay in the LA area or were you San Diego or? No, we were in the LA area. We stayed in yeah. the LA area, not San Diego. And um, got an apartment and then moved to another one, a three bedroom apartment, and then got a house. Yeah. Would people ever contact you who left the church? Mm. Or, or, or were you pretty much, uh, you guys were just your, your family, you know, you, you had uh, your family and, and Suzette's? I mean, how, all I'm saying is when you're when you have L. Ron Hubbard's daughter, you're married to L. Ron Hubbard's daughter. You're working for a Scientologist, so you have to. You're basically on a tightrope in some ways, aren't you? You've got to keep Doring happy. Well, you know, of course, you know, working anywhere, you would want your boss to be happy. But sure, I think um, there was always like. Well, well let me re always go ahead. Okay, let, let me rephrase it. When you and Suzette left the church, unlike most people, you were not declared suppressive persons. No, we weren't. And, and, and that makes you unique in that sense. They weren't going to declare you. No. And so that'll, that's why, why you can work at the Doring Company, because had you been declared, like so many Seward members are who blow, you couldn't have worked for a Scientologist. Correct. And that kind of shows Miscavige's tension. He he doesn't want to declare, you know, he's got Mary Sue in the house at Chislehurst that Ron bought her. He's got Neville Neville minding her, right? Mm -hmm. And so you you have to make your own way in the world. Mm -hmm. And you know, yeah, I need to use the the you know the cards I have. You know, I've worked in marketing. I've been an executive. You know, so those are those are recognized valuables. You know, um, there are people who leave and they figure out how to translate the functions that they had or the training that they had into language that would be understood. You know, particularly if they worked in cine, they could go from sound or lighting or you know sets. Um, yeah, if they had a practical skill. Yes. Yeah. As opposed to, say, being an ethics officer. Right. And then what are you going to do? Work out as a, uh, uh, you know, go into the correction system as a guard, maybe. It, and you, But it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be um, recognized that you had any experience because it's not something that you can translate. Well, you know what, Guy, for, for uh, people who've left the Sea Org, or maybe even lurkers who are listening therein, how did you reinvent yourself and your identity once you left the church? Did it take years for you? Were you still a Scientologist in your mind or were you not a Scientologist? I was still, I was still a Scientologist, you know, and I did the, um, when someone blows, they go through some steps that are called A to E and did those steps and then worked with a, a church person um, to assist in getting Suzette to go through those steps. I went through those steps and then did solo and OT1, 2, and 3 hmm. after I left. Really? You did? You went up yeah. through OT3? Yeah. 
Just as an aside, what did you think when you read the OT3 course pack and learned the secrets? Um, I, I my response literally was, "This is it. This is this is what it is." Um, I was disappointed, but you know, it supposedly is what it is, and you you know. Well, but you have a different perspective because the guy who wrote it's your father-in-law. Yeah. I mean, did you think in terms of like, this is my father-in-law wrote this? Mm, not really, because I think that I was a Scientologist first, mm -hmm. right, before I met Suzette. So even though life became much more complicated once I was married into the family, right, um, because I had had years before that on different posts and training and doing different things, I was a Scientologist before I was a family member. And so I could, I, you know, I still had that. However, there, there, there is a, um, it was odd because let's say among Scientologists in the field in Los Angeles, right? The fact of being, their perception of the family was that there's, you know, unlimited financial resources, hmm. right? Right. No, not true. <laughs> you know, not true. Um, well, that's a good question. What did what did L. Ron Hubbard leave his kids? What was in that document when Suzette signed it was basically the acceptance of fifty thousand dollars. That's it. Yeah. $50,000. $50,000. That's just shocking, actually. It is. And in fact, um, in a conversation with Mary Sue, she said because nothing was left from Ron, her husband, right, she wanted to amass as much as she could for her kids and grandkids. You know, so she did um, put some money together for that. Nothing against the amount of money that was there that really. Um, yeah, the, the big money. The big money. Yeah. You know? the, uh, church but, took, the church took all the big money. Yeah. But left, you know, her house that she had. And so she leaves that to a third or third or third or three children. And she put a, a education trust for each of the grandkids. It was like $100,000. Um, but no, we're not talking, you know big, big money, but she did look out for that and want to do that specifically because she said it wasn't done through run. No, and that's that's a big, it shows you how little value <clears throat> that uh, David Miscavige and company placed on the family of the founder. And they make a big deal about L. Ron Hubbard being the founder. Like you yes. said, they, they, they've tried to like uh, create him to be basically a, a, a god-like figure. And this is, this is a question Scientologists dance around. You know, they'll say L. Ron Hubbard was not God, mm -hmm. but, but he's a god-like figure. Mm -hmm. So for all intents and purposes, he's the divine figure in Scientology. Mm -hmm. Because he makes metaphysical statements like, why I was chosen, we're not going to get into why I was chosen to rise above the bank. Right. He says that in KSW. And so you being a Scientologist first, and then you, you realize that Ron is this flesh and blood person, mm -hmm. and you're married to his daughter. Mm -hmm. does, that, does that change your view of L. Ron Harvard? You know, it, in, in a way, it, in a way, it, does in that I got a much more, you know, there's a story there separate from Scientology, like LRH, the man, yeah, the father, the grandfather, the husband for Mary Sue, Mary Sue. And so the human face of L. Ron Hubbard and Mary Sue and Suzette and any of them, you know, is um, its own story. They are not defined by Scientology. You know, in fact, even LRH at one point had said, he wrote an advice and he said, you know, um, the family is not property of the church. They're entitled to their own lives. Wow. And that, and that 
if any attack on them, the family, is really an attack on him. Hmm. Now, was he speaking of his own family here? Yes. Wow. I've yeah. never, I, I, I'd like to locate that policy and put it in the show notes. It'll, I'm sure it's a note, you know, yeah. a, 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 an advice. Oh, an advice. You know? So it's not yeah. really not publicly available. No, it was never issued to the, to, you know, at that level. Well, here, here's another curious thing about L. Ron Hubbard. <clears throat> because in my podcast, you know, I, and, and I'm fully aware of, of Fair Game, and I've, Karen and I have certainly been the recipient of it. Some notes about Hubbard as a person, okay? Mm-hmm. And, and I'm not, in no way, I really want listeners to understand, I'm in no way lessening this, the horror of what he did, the monstrous, monstrous organization he created or, or his viciousness as a person. When you look at when you look at Aaron Hubbard, something that stands out, um, he 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 became a member of the Explorers Club long before he created Dianetics, right? He wrote Dianetics, yeah. and and one one interesting thing to me is, is studying Hubbard is he stayed a member of the Explorers Club until the day he died, and he kept his address at the Explorers Club, hmm. and and to me. Here's two things I'll tell you from from my time studying the man. When he was a member of the Explorers Club, he didn't have to be L. Ron Hubbard's source, founder of Scientology. Mm-hmm. But the, the, the times he would go in there, he could be a member of the Explorers Club. And then the other thing that stands out to me when I when my dear friend uh, Bill Franks, Karen and I just loved him, and uh, he died, you know, and I, I do miss Bill dearly. Mm-hmm. Um, when Bill Franks was on the ship, Ron used to call John Horwich and Bill up to the cabin late at night. And Ron would just go on and talk and talk and talk. He needed to not, he just needed to be Ron talking to guys, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And they would be there and Ron would tell Bill, and I have this all on my, my podcast. He would say, mm-hmm. like, I just can't get enough money and power, Bill. I just crave it. And he had to let his hair down and not be source. And I once asked Bill on a podcast, I said, Bill, you're sitting in an office on the ship with L. Ron Hubbard, the creator of Scientology and the OT levels. Are you thinking he's some transcendental being? Because I'm, you know, I'm wanting to get mm-hmm. Bill's, mm-hmm. Bill's what reaction. What the view would be, sure. Yeah, and, and Bill says, no, I'm thinking that I have to get up really early in the morning to do my job <laughs> and Ron's keeping me up all night talking Yeah, and I got to get up early and he can sleep in. I can't. Yeah. <laughs> so it's really interesting when you really get down to, to Ron Hubbard, the person and Mary Sue Hubbard, the person and the family. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we were talking, for example, I asked you before the show, I asked you if you'd been to St. Hill. Mm-hmm. And you were there before they built the castle and everything. And you said that, like, the, the kids' bicycles were still there, right? They were. It was it was as it was and kept as it was when they left and went to the ship. So the bicycles were still on the front porch. The house was just basically – that was the house. It was, like, kept as a, a museum piece, not changing. Like, he yeah. could come back there at any point. You know, that's interesting that the story you tell there or, or that – Bill Franks had told, you know, um, even going all the way forward, like my conversations with Suzette, she said she doesn't agree with everything her father did. She doesn't agree with everything that he said, but there's still a place in her world that this is her father. Sure. And, you know, and I think that's really, you know, really good of Suzanne. Yeah. You know, because she knows the man, she knows the father and there are, it's much more interesting on all the shades of gray than just black and white thinking. Yeah. When you're a family member, absolutely. You know, because but going back then as a family member, there is like a certain element of what is expected public relations wise, you know, you, you don't want the family to be a mess. You don't want them, you know, um, but at the same time, they're entitled to their lives. 
True. You know, but coming coming out, it was like thought that there was just unlimited resources, and there weren't unlimited resources. You know, I have Suzette and a you know two year old, now three year old, and a, and a, and a baby on the way, and. I got to get to work and get some, make some money, you know, so it's much more practical. Everything gets so washed, whitewashed, but there's a practical side to the family. Well, yeah, sure. There's the real life part. You've got kids to raise and bills to pay like everybody else. Right. It shows the absolute gap between L. Ron Hubbard's insular, fabulously wealthy life, paranoid, in hiding. And there's such a huge gap between L. Ron Hubbard's final years, the kind of distorted life he led. Yeah. Where he obsessively purchased camera lenses from catalogs that he never used. Mm -hmm. He had exotic animals. He's like in this other world out of touch with reality. Mm -hmm. David Miscavige is running the dangerous environment racket on him. You'd better stay where you're at because it's, it's not safe for you to leave. Mm -hmm. And he dearly wants to get back into, you know what I mean? He's off of his point of power, you know? Well, well, this is another point I'll add just to, we, since we're discussing the human element, Bill Franks told me that uh, when he was executive director international for life Mm -hmm. for that very short period, it didn't turn out to be for life. You know, Bill, Bill uh, relates the story. He just gets sacked as EDN. He just get, gets fired, right? Mm-hmm. And and Dr. Dank, uh, L. Ron Hubbard's personal physician, doesn't know this. Mm-hmm. So so he, Dr. Dank goes to Bill Franks, and I have Bill discussing this, you know, on in a podcast. And he says, um, Bill, we got a problem, and, and and Dr. Dank doesn't know who to talk to. He says, Bill, Ron's developing dementia. He's got early onset, you know, dementia. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So so Ron's beginning to develop dementia. Ron can't show his human side to his church. In fact, he has to go off lines to keep his human side very safe from the authorities. And I don't know that his his kids, did they ever, I mean, Suzette was never aware of this, was she, that her father had legal problems and people were out to sue him? Was she aware of the amount of? She was aware of of all clear, as was Mary Sue. I mean, I remember one time Mary Sue saying, you know, maybe it's the name. She was making a joke, you know, Sue, Mm. Mary. Mary Sue, you know, that there's so much uh, legal problems. And, it, you know, it was generally understood that the reason LRH was not there was because of these legal problems. And, you know, All Clear was a very real movement to make it such that he could come back. Even like, you know, once one, one, um, one day on the weekends, I forget if it's Saturday or Sunday, but we would have renos up at the base, right? And right. one of the things that was done was, was, you know, refurbishing the house that he had, Bonnie View, right? So that he could, once all clear happens and he comes back to the base, he could just walk in there and it would be ready to go. So even in the working of things, it was like the base you know, you're getting ready for when he comes back, when all clear is handled and he can come back and he can be there and that this is a real thing that's going to happen. You know, so that is the reality that's being communicated, you know? Yeah. That's the context that you expect, yes. him, expect him to come back and he can, he can, you know, occupy his place again in the, at the top of Scientology. And, and yet that never happens. No. Do no. you know, just one final question, guys. We we end up this part. We I, I certainly want to continue with some more interviews. But does Suzette? Does she remember the last time she saw her father? I'm sure she does. Yeah, I'm sure she does. Yeah, I'd uh, like to know when that was the last time she physically saw him. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and did a, after she no longer saw him, did he write her letters periodically? Um, I don't know. Yeah, that's so interesting because the church certainly sought to control his communication. David Miscavige, Pat mm-hmm. Broker, sought to control all the communication to and from. Mm-hmm. So, so you know, it, it shows what it is to be a Hubbard in the Church of Scientology. Mm-hmm. A, a very complex, difficult place to be in. 
Yeah. Both in the church and when you leave the church. Yeah. So, well, Guy, yeah. I, I, I really appreciate the, the insights you've given us in these two interviews. I look forward to, to talking more because I'd like to discuss your post-Scientology career, mm -hmm. things like survival insurance, read Slack, and just a sure. lot of stuff to talk <laughs> about. But thank you so much for your time, Guy, and we'll wait for part three. And for Surviving Scientology Radio, this is your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Thank you so much. Thank for you, Jeff. Oh, thank you, Guy. You were the best to have on. I really appreciate it. For our listeners out there, thank you for listening. And we'll be back with parts three and four very soon with Guy White.